Okay, yeah, so good. in comics this week to finish out the show, um, one that I think is easily my favorite comic of the year so far um, is Clayface, uh, Batman, One Bad Day, Clayface. And this is Colin Kelly and Jeff Lansing and writing it. And uh, I, I butcher the artist name. I don't want to say the artist name because I always butcher it. Zola, Zola, I, uh, Matt, help me, save me. What is the artist name for, is he frozen? Is that frozen, Matt, up there? I think he's looking. No, wait, maybe he he's is frozen. frozen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, frozen Matt can't save go. me because it's not real Matt. Oh, there, oh, there is. it is. Oh, there he is. Yeah, do you oh, hear me? anyway. No. Uh, it's uh, Zermonico. Zermonico, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, my Latin brother, for helping me out <laughs> and saving me. Um, um, yeah, so this book is, I, 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 this is what I love about DC, is DC takes these shots in, and puts out these kind of books and is willing to do these kind of darker, more adult tales and, and just kind of play with their mythos on any given Sunday, right? There's like, hey, it's Sunday. Let's play with a clay face or a Bane tale. And these one bad days have been surprisingly good. Um, I loved Bane. I loved Catwoman. I love this. And this is my favorite of the of the bunch. And um, you, you don't, this makes Clayface who can, I don't think I've been this scared of Clayface since that origin episode of Batman, the animated series <laughs> where they, where they did it. And there's one scene that I'm still like, I showed it and I was watching it with my son. I was like, I don't think you really should be showing that to kid where Clayface is like imitating a woman. And then his, their eyes get all yellow and then she gets yeah. all like freaky and her face melts. But this somehow makes Clayface even scarier, not just in his powers, but in his pathos, in his mind. In the way that Boris, uh, uh, you know, what's his name? I always butcher his name. Um, Basil Carlo, Basil Basil mm, Carlo, yeah, Basil, like, Carlo. Yeah, Basil Carlo, yeah, like in his pathos, in the way he thinks, and how how casually he'll horribly murder somebody as a means of climbing the Hollywood ladder and just to get acting roles. And um, yeah, this book, like I said to the creators, my favorite parts of this book are just him doing stuff in the mirror, trying to find his own identity or act in front of a mirror in these horrific ways. Like one of the first images is of him and introducing himself while he has like a little human arm and the rest of him is this horrible clay monster. And yeah, this book really just messes with your mind about entertainment, Hollywood and Clayface as a character. Like I would see, I could now see them doing something like a Clayface in Matt Reeves Batman universe. Yeah. Sure. As like somebody, especially with like the flood and whatever might've spilled out and could have gotten into somebody and being that kind of just killer monster. So, like I said, this is one's going to stick with me for a long time. This is one of my favorite kind of DC one shots and one of my favorite kind of taking what is like a B or C level DC villain and turning it into a really great story. Um, so kudos to them. Yeah. Janelle Connor. Beautiful. I, it's just beautiful. It's an amazing book and it's, I read it twice now through and it's long and it's wordy, but I don't care because it's so good that you just lose track of time. And it's just, uh, I mean, the interview was incredible too. Like they're so passionate about it and they have such a refreshing take, like being in LA and Hollywood and all of that. And, you know, we're all technically kind of in entertainment. And so it's really relatable, especially like with the music stuff. I was just kind of like, wow, <laughs> like I feel this on a deep level. Yeah, it's like like what I asked him about last week. It's that last that last page, that last page. encapsulates the horror, the pathos and the tragedy of this character. So, no, it's it's an absolute must read. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, and that's a uh, high praise. That's already you know we're we're early in the year, but this is definitely a um a, a best of year contender. Killer. And these yeah. these one bad days have been great, uh, and there's one more coming up uh, from Tom Taylor, and that's probably going to be great too with Ray Shal Ghoul. So uh, we we don't seem to be ending anytime soon. Welcome back to Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture, and the only podcast of ComicBook.com. If you're just so, if you're just tuning in right now, we just did our first half of the show talking about the big trailer, uh, the Flash. We were supposed to talk about other Super Bowl trailers, but eh, forget those guys. You can watch all that on comicbook.com movies. Fast X, cool. John Wick, cool. Guardians, kind of disappointing. Everything else, kind of meh for me. But you can go watch that all. Like I said, on comic book movies. We are going to be moving on now because we are continuing our awesome interview series that uh, our own Matthew Aguilar has been spearheading this year in this season. Uh, Matt, who do we got today? 
Well, we are going to be talking about Batman One Bad Day Clayface uh, with the creators, Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing. And we're going to be talking all about this right now. How are you guys? Whoop. Hello. Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> We're like, wait, are we on camera? Are we on camera? Are we on camera? <laughs> <laughs> Boom, you're on camera. Almost Welcome. got that transition. Live Just streaming, like a hair man. Early. It was a hair early. Sorry about well, that. Well, good to see you all. Yeah, it's Great okay. We're in, yeah, we're in season five, and we all still react like that every time. Sometimes it's where we have really <laughs> loud intro music. Show up. Yeah, yeah, I know. We're just, I think that's what it is. It's an innate. We're just surprised that people continue to do the show. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, how, it's how you keep it honest. If, if, the internet got, if the internet got too polished, we don't have to get off. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Just, uh, working in the studio, listening to you guys talking about the Flash trailer, I feel like we wanted to be here a half hour early to join in all the uh, all the good chatting. <laughs> a lot of oh, oh, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know, God, I know, I know too much. I, I, I know too much about that movie. I can't talk about it. I know, oh, I, know, well. I know secrets. I know secrets. None of you know. Ooh. I gotta be. I gotta be super chill when it comes to the flower. Well, can we I, ask I, you right off the bat? Say, I'm psyched. <laughs> without revealing a thing, do you what like from zero to ten? How what is the le level of audience mind blowedness? Do you think is going to happen? That is going to happen in this movie. Ten. I think I, wow. I, I think I think if if half the stuff that I have heard is true from people who should know, it, it, ten it, insane, complete madness. I, I but I mean but also I hear the movies like incredible. So, so yeah, that's what we were talking about how well it was testing and how much doubt there was around that until this trailer kind of came out and really began to reverse that opinion. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, now that we're on it, I mean, we had this for later. We were going to throw you guys into this uh, conversation. But Janelle, I think is a good time for your question would be right now. I have a few, but what are your current most anticipated DCU projects? And are there any unannounced plans or even rumors for the franchise that have you pumped? I... <laughs> I, Both I, I'm actually different. really so out of the out of the gun announcements, the thing that mm -hmm. psychs me up the most, uh, weirdly, is Paradise Lost. If only because I think that that's a really uh, yes, a really unessayed part of the DCU. It's something that uh, I I've always felt like the DCU plays best on film when it uh, leans into its fantasy roots a little harder because it's something that, that it, it gets to do that um, Marvel really doesn't. Uh, and the whole slate feels kind of fantasy to me. Uh, like it's either like Morrison or kind of fantasy, which I dig. Um, so I'm really excited about Paradise Lost. I want to see how they, what they build out of that, how how they can introduce new stuff, how they can bring in stuff from the Wonder Woman canon, but also probably from like other mythological canons. Um, you know, Game of Thrones with Wonder Woman is like an easy move for me. Like I, I want that. That's exactly what Amazing. I want. Amazing. So I'm, I'm yeah. Dude, and same. It's my number two. The, oh, yeah? Like, yeah. Next oh, yeah. Supergirl. We ranked them all. Yeah, we ranked. <laughs> so, oh, nice. Yes. Love Solid. it. Awesome. Colin, what about you? Um, I got to say, if if this, if Superman is going to be following All-Star Superman, I mean, it is one of the greatest Superman stories ever told. Um, I feel like, God love Henry Cavill, I feel like we've been dancing around the perfect Superman movie, but we have yet to get it. And if he can bring if he can bring all-star to life, if he can nail that core of hope, especially if we're telling a story about like effectively Superman's last days. I mean, I think that's exactly the kind of optimistic, powerful story that the nation and the world could really use. Um, just please God, don't make him murder anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Well, I mean, that's a, but that's a perfect segue into the book that you guys worked on, which does include <laughs> quite yeah. a bit of murder in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rule, I was going to say a completely comic. different tone. Hundred <laughs> percent. Um, that was what was no. that? Uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Go. Oh no! I mean, that's why we did this in a in large part uh, because we are not uh, guys who tend to write what a quote phone is just gone uh quote unquote like mean stories uh we are pretty optimistic writers we people who who know us from our dc stuff know us for uh yeah we just killed bruce wayne and batman beyond neo year but we spent six issues uplifting terry and bringing a family around him and like doing a lot of like very optimistic work um in neo gotham we uh did, did gotham city garage which was all about hope surviving the thing well, thank you, man. Uh, uh, I love a sort that of like series. hopeless uh, uh, Luther fascism. Like we are very much a uh, a sort of like hope kids, 
And so when they came to us and said, hey, we, we want you to do one of these one bad days, um, you know, they're going to be doing an initiative that's all designed to sort of like do a killing joke for every single Batman villain who's never gotten like a great killing joke style story. And we said, wow, awesome. And they told us that creative teams were like, why are you telling us this? These guys all sound awesome. And they were like, oh, because we want you to do Clayface. And there was like a pause. We were like, <laughs> you want us to do a one bad day? And they were like, yeah. We we're like, uh, I mean, and Clayface, huh? And they're like, yeah. It was like, why? And then Dave Will goes, who's their editor over there, goes, well, because you guys live in Hollywood and you know how terrible it is. So, and, there was, <laughs> and, and that really clicked into place because he wanted us to explore. Obviously, Basil is an actor, right? Like, this is his entire life. This is kind of putting on different faces and trying to be uh, the celebrity that he's always existed as, as in his mind. Um, and, you know, to Jack's point, we, uh, we started our career as writers uh, as Hollywood guys. Uh, some other writers call us the Hollywood kids. Uh, Steve well, Orlando specifically called us calls us the Hollywood <laughs> boys, which yeah, is yeah. like even more like. Okay. Uh, but that's kind of the world we live in uh, in our in our other lives. And what happens out here is, you know, everyone comes out here chasing a dream. Everyone comes out here with hope in their eyes, and. On a long enough timeline, you can find success, but that success means that you have to get beaten. You have to take all these hits. You have to bleed. You have to suffer. And for the two of us, that's one of the reasons that we work as a writing partnership, because you always have an ally at your side, right? You are never alone. But for an actor, especially, coming out here is so brutal because you have people specifically saying it's not just your acting, it's your face, right? It's you. We don't want you. As opposed to us, we can hide behind, oh, they didn't want like the scripts, right? But for an actor in particular, it's so painful. So we have, you know, over a decade, we have a decade and a half of pain built up in our hearts over how toxic Hollywood can be. Love you, Hollywood. But <laughs> that's when, when Dave said, you guys are unique to tell the tragic story of Clayface in the town of Angels, in the city of Angels. We were like, oh my God, yes, please. Let us excise some of that bile that has been living in us. Uh, and put it on the page. Amazing. Go. Oh, I'm saying you guys are pros. You guys have ripped through so many questions that we had as our <laughs> next follow-up <laughs> questions. So let's just catch up. So yes, now we know why you guys chose Carlo. We got that as opposed to, I guess there were no other discussions of other clay phases. We can cross oh, that no. one off the list. Straight um, up, it was Basil Carlo for moments. And, and just so it yeah. said, like, we love what James did. We love uh, a sympathetic, like, that's one of the great things, right? He's such a sympathetic character. But the point of a one bad day isn't, let's have a hero turn, right? Let's yeah. explore the tragedy and pain of these but, characters. But it is about sympathy, right? And I think, again, that's, that's what's beautiful about these stories, is it's about sympathy for the monster. But monster needs to be, like, bolded and underlined, especially when it comes to Clayface, who can very easily hide behind what seems like very um like relatable motivation anybody who's ever been an artist understands the concept of like having a vision and wanting to have it you know wanting to right. extend that vision wanting to stand by your vision even when people tell you that it won't work or it's madness or whatever and the idea of having a character who defends that vision so hard that he's willing to kill for it uh and is is willing to subsume himself into it uh, and may lose himself entirely into it. That felt like a really great and very, um, uh, for us, very relatable turn because it's exactly the kind of thing we, we've gone through in our own ways. Um, you know, just not to such an extreme, obviously. Well, as you guys funny. touch on, uh, oh, sorry, I was just saying, as you touch on the one bad day series that we're kind of getting, we did, we also talked about Bane on the show mm -hmm. is based on the killing joke. And in this, you guys without spoilers get to have fun with that idea in a very kind of meta way. How much fun was it playing with the kind of meta-ness of doing this comic story, but playing with both Hollywood and other kind of adaptations of things? Was that challenging or fun and cathartic for you guys? All three. All three, my friend. <laughs> Like, so um, I, I feel like we can tell the audience kind of what the premise of that, at least a little bit. Is yeah, it's not, it's not much of a spoiler. No, and I think it really kind of plays into it. Um, the role that um, that Clayface is running out for is a Hollywood adaptation of uh, of the Joker story, the Killing Joke, right? And it's you know it's kind of the hero turd. It's the Hollywood version of this adventure, um, but 
you know, that's kind of what we get to play with. So we get to explore, you know, how Hollywood would have treated these actual stories of Batman uh, in a really fun way, in a really meta way as well. And that wasn't in the outline that we originally had approved. Uh, we kind of just dropped it in because we knew he needed to be exploring a role. Uh, and then as soon as we started playing with that idea, it kind of was a no brainer. It's something that was also very fun doing that um, beyond the, I think the, the necessary nature of, oh, we're going to need a movie because we knew that we had, uh, at the very least, we wanted to be in an audition. We wanted to be on set. And then we were going to echo that one last time at the end of the book. Uh, and we knew that that was kind of the framework is like, oh, there's going to be a movie. There's going to be an audition. There's going to be a set. There's going to be this, this final monologue. And like, we knew that that was going to lay out, but we weren't certain what the movie was until we were writing it. And I, I think it was around the time that we paneled it into my panel grid which it was obviously a, a huge um, sort of formalist effort in The Killing Joke. The Killing Joke is built on grid. Um, the, every page has sort of a nine panel grid structure and, and, and format effectively within uh, that book. And that was very sort of deliberately done. So we got to our nine panel, which we like to use specifically for um, things like monologues because it allows the actor to take central, like the, the quote unquote actor on the page to take central frame. You, you can really see their changes because every, it's a three by three grid and every panel you're kind of seeing the same angle or something close to the same angle. So you can really see the acting. Tom King obviously does this to enormously excellent uh, 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 effect in a lot of his work. Um, and to the point where it kind of became a joke with him. It's like, oh yeah, it's another nine panel grid by Tom. But like he, but there's a reason why he does it. It, it works so well for the kind of comics he does. So we were like, okay, we're gonna do, you know, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do a little nine panel here and that'll give us that moment. Um, and then I think at that point we looked across the table from each other. I don't know which one of us said it, but we were like, well, if we're doing nine panel, then we were directly referencing Killing Joke in a book that's already referencing Killing Joke in its format and its logo <laughs> and its name. It's like, well, we might as well go all the way here and really lean into that because fans will understand that. And people who don't will will be will at least have maybe seen Joker and will know that what we're kind of referencing here, because we never say the word Joker, right? We don't, we never say the word Jack Napier. We don't, we never like say the thing, but we say enough about it to get you to the thing. And then eventually I think we say killing joke on the slate. Um, so it was a fun, like, but yeah, our, our thing was like, oh, but they'll kill this uh, in the in the draft. Like we'll turn this in and then DC will be like, yeah, just change the name <laughs> of the movie. And they didn't, which I thought was stunning. We were both really uh, excited that that got in, um, which is a microcosm of what it's like to work at DC right now. Like DC is just a great free, very weird place to tell stories. They're they're really opening up the um, the, the toy chest and letting people like, play around uh, right now, which has just been a blast for people like us um, who've, who've been uh, dying to do it for years. No, that's awesome. Uh, you know, it's funny, you, you mentioned like drawing the line between the monster and, you know, the person still having sympathy. And I think the artwork goes a, a long way uh, to oh telling that story. Um, you know, Zermonico and Romulo doing some just gorgeous, gorgeous work right here. And we've seen it, some of it, you know, pop up on the screen. Um, you know, what did they kind of bring uh to that to that story that maybe you hadn't envisioned you know because i know sometimes the back and forth process can be really kind of different than what you go in expecting zermonico is a genius um like in a in a I, and i say this as somebody we, we get to work with genius artists all day long um we, we have very good luck in that regard zermonico every page colin i had to be like oh my god <laughs> like like how, how is this what is how we <laughs> We dropped so many weird challenges in this book, format-wise, formally, screenplay pages, um, yeah, there's a silent beats that have to play on an actor's face. There's a mix. There's a mixed media element to this book that we're really proud of, um, that people might really enjoy. And the cool thing is, like, you know, he doesn't come from Hollywood, but he learned screenplay format. Like, he learned actually how to kind of put that stuff together. Um, and his work is just so, I don't know if we can swear, so flipping, uh, so flipping human. Uh, through Clayface, and that was so crucial, right? Seeing, being able to take this goo monster and like, look, we all love, a good, <laughs> all love a good goo monster, but then make it human and be able to take those shapes and that expression and kind of find something that is um, so true and uh, like li literally gobsmacking. Um, if you, even if you don't, I always say this, even if you don't read any of our words, pick it up for the art alone, because uh, it is going to absolutely blow your mind. Also, you, one of the things you, you, you might have seen in the uh, it, when you guys were running the the panels, I thought what was really cool is almost everything you ran were his uh, 
in-universe movie posters that he designed and painted and then placed into the background of various shots. Oh. So you, you weren't even seeing like, like interior art from the comic, really. There were a couple of pages of interior art, but most of it was like the Grey Ghost poster or the Western poster, which he just... Like, we were like, I don't know, there's there's going to be some posters in the back. It'd be nice if one of them was Great Ghost, because we're going to reference it at some point. Cla and, classic writer bullshit. Uh, behind yeah, yeah. the seven posters from movies that have happened in the past. I don't and, know. And uh, Zermatico was just like, oh, uh, I painted some posters. And I put, like, they're in the background. Here's some here's some high-res ones if you guys want them. I was like... And, and literally, you know, he painted them, and then, you know, you 3D juxtapose them, put them into the frames themselves. But it's... Uh, yeah, it's just a stunning piece of work. Uh, he yeah. went so above and beyond and poured everything he had into this, uh, and it, it shows, man. Yeah, I was amazed. You guys aren't exaggerating. I was amazed about how much entertainment value I could get out of just pictures of Clayface standing in front of a mirror with himself, and I was just like, <laughs> highly entertaining. Um, well, yeah. yeah. And well, when you're like, when, 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 when we pitched this, I remember a big part of what we pitched, and this was the great opportunity of One Bad Day, was when they asked for the pitch in the first place, they were like, keep in mind, you do not need to put Batman in this book. Like, Batman can be in this book, and if you and if there's a great place for Batman in this book, go for it. But unlike almost any other book that has the word Batman in the title, you do not need to anchor this on Bruce, and you don't need to anchor this on, on action. So don't feel like you need to get this to a fight scene, Right just feel like you got to get to where the characters need to go and then you'll figure it out from there. And so we wrote it very much with that idea of like, well, it's going to be a lot of pages of Clayface standing in front of mirrors or like, here's a double, like rather than a double page spread of Batman and Clayface, like fighting over the Gotham skyline, uh, we were going to lead with like a double page spread of Clayface working at the Chateau Marmont and like meeting his coworkers. Like that's, a very different challenge for DC. It's not the kind of thing you normally get to do in a superhero comic. And it was really a, uh, it was such a great way to spread wins and like for everybody to just try something really new here. I know talking about the art, uh, it definitely had a profound effect on some of our team members, Connor. You can, uh, you can state your grievance now. No, oh, it's, it's no grievance. It's praise. Um, <laughs> the, the last page that particular visual and i won't i won't spoil it for the folks who haven't read it but i won't lie it's haunted me since since reading it and it, i i was just curious who came up with that specific visual and that internal monologue that needed that had to cap everything off and where did the idea of that particular i won't say it outright but that visual yeah where where in the process of creating this did that come into play Unless I recall mistakenly, it was almost the first. Okay. Yeah. Like, wow. We, like that was the image that we had in our heads. And, you know, and Jack and I, we call ourselves the hive mind, right? At this point, we've been writing together for almost a decade and a half. Um, we basically share one brain cell. Uh, and that image. <laughs> only one, only one cell. <laughs> one brain cell. <laughs> uh, and that was, that's the whole ball game, right? Like that, that image, that idea um, that we will not spoil is is the landing point that we knew we needed to hit it's also when we're looking at comps um because this is a story about hollywood it's a story about fame it's a story about um how you subsume yourself for other things um we knew pretty early that this story had to was going to sort of be in conversation with other stories like this and movies like this and sure. uh there's a particular image from uh the from a movie that has meant a lot to me over my life, weirdly, um, uh, which is Little Shop of Horrors, uh, that that image is in direct conversation with. Um, like, it's, it's I, I don't think we looked at each other and said, oh, we're going to do a Little Shop. But I think there was part of us that was like, hey, there's, there's, a, um, there's a haunting aspect to uh, being at the end of a killing spree and what it means to, uh, to be to be at the end of that, having learned what we've learned about Clayface, it's very hard to talk about without spoiling it. Um, but I, I think that, in terms of figuring out that image, that was always gonna be there. The monologue was really interesting. I wanna sort of like like talk to that because we talked a little bit about like, oh, we didn't really know what the monologue was gonna be until we were on page. But we knew that it was gonna recur three times. We we're gonna see it in the, in the audition, we were gonna see it on set, and then we were gonna see it at the end. And so when we were writing our pages, we left those pages blank. Yeah. We were like, we wrote the nine panel, 
but we didn't really like, you know, we, we sort of wrote like the acting, but we didn't write the words. And then we sat there after the script was done and we said, okay, what is this monologue gonna be? What's the best, like we looked back at Killing Joke and we we're like, is there something we can grab from there? We obviously don't want to like just use Alan Moore's words because that would be cheap. Uh, you know, that's like being like, hey, I, we wrote some Shakespeare. It's like, no, mm. like write the, <laughs> write the monologue. But we knew we wanted it to be sort of inspired by and be a twist on Alan Moore's storytelling structure. And, and, and the kind of story he was trying to tell. So we like went in and, and uh, filled that in afterwards. And then it was really a question of like, how is that going to echo properly to the front, to the, to the middle and to the back? And then getting to that last line. I think that last line is something that really wasn't on the page until the very end. Like we went, or we went, <coughs> it's not like we went round and round on it, but I don't think we knew what that last line was going to be. And once we realized it and how it would pair with the image, we had a feeling it could be haunting, right? That was the whole point. We, we, we knew we wanted to leave you with this particular feeling and this particular image and this particular um, sort of tragedy, because this is a tragedy. And if we can, which again, just you don't get to do in superhero comics all that often. Mm. So that was a, it was, uh, I'm very happy that it worked. I'm happy that it haunted you. I'm sorry, uh, but I'm very happy it did that <laughs> okay. because that was in every way the, uh, the, uh, the hope. And then, I mean, to me, it's the page before. The, the, the second to last page, which is sort of a twist on the nine panel, but there's these silent panels. Those silent panels live rent free in my head now. There's some scare, like Zermanico nailed those and Romulo nailed the color. Like all of it is just so haunting. I'm really, uh, I'm very, very uh, happy with how that turned out. And, and I do know that we, um, we're kind of running out of time here. So I would be, uh, I would be, uh, 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 remiss. Yes. If I didn't point out that uh, a lot of this is true. Um, you know, not to Clay, like Clayface is fictional, obviously, but a lot of the lines of dialogue that we've experienced, basically everyone in the Chateau Marmont, one of our best friends, um, Dylan DeVale, actually worked. He's an actor and a lot of this is kind of, there was a lot of reflection of him and he worked at that, um, at that hotel and we kind of brought a lot of that in. A lot of these characters are direct riffs on people we know uh, down to their names. Shout out to the Kondrats. Um, and especially some of the lines, there's a line um, from a producer that haunts us still uh, <laughs> where we were in a meeting and we had all these great ideas and he looked us dead in the eyes and said, this is a listening meeting. No, this should be more of a listening session for you. Yeah, this should be more this should of be a more listening session. session for you is the, is the most brutal way I've ever been told to shut up. And it was, and like, we it's it, it's just sat in our head forever and i was like i've never been more close to becoming clayface <laughs> than <laughs> in that moment. yeah um and so getting to do get, so getting to, to translate that directly onto the page was deeply cathartic oh i think <laughs> so that, cathartic. that's a that's a thing that i hope if as people read this if they find the real honesty and truth in it know that we are literally putting our hearts on the page here like this is us excising a lot of the toxicity that we have had to internalize uh, and we hope people get entertainment out of our pain <laughs> <laughs> um you know uh one last question and i know we got to get you uh you guys out of here um you know i'm a i'm a huge as noted in the i was i was celebrating a little bit earlier because i heard Gotham city garage uh mentioned i'm a huge fan of that series um just love the the characters and the world building um Absolutely. you know would you want to see uh that in in live action or animation ah! someday ah! Y yeah, yes. yes, yes, we would. Yes, we would. Very much. <laughs> Easy answer. <laughs> we, we, would do a, we would do 100 more issues of it. Like, we loved Gotham City Garage. That book was canceled before it ever started. And we, it, we, were, uh, we were just pushing that boulder uphill out of sheer love um, for those characters, for that world, um, for a chance to tell a really different kind of story with Wonder Woman, to tell a really different relationship with Supergirl and Batgirl, um, which to this day is one of my favorite relationships we've gotten to do. Um, I the, the thing I'm always really sad about is that we, we put dirtbag drunk Guy Gardner on the table. Like we had like, oh yeah, like the one of the only guys in the Gotham City garage is, is Guy Gardner and he's an absolute mess. And we always had an issue that we wanted to do that was just a day with Guy that was just your like, your sort of like drunken <laughs> samurai issue. And I, to this day, I'm like, I don't know when we get to do it, but someday we'll do 
our uh, drunken dirtbag guy gardener out in the old west story because that was way too fun. Ah! And we will say, you know, this is there's no, you know, this is far off on the horizon, but we may not be done with all of those characters. Yeah. Oh, yay. Okay. I get to look. I just need something to keep me going for like, you know, another couple of years, decades. Matt, we got you. Oh, no. got you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure you, your, your crops are watered. <laughs> all right. Well, we can end ending with a happy note of Matt is always good. So uh, we try to keep him a little bit happy over here. So we want to thank you guys for joining us. Everybody, if you don't have this on your radar, you definitely need to. This is Batman, One Bad Day, Clayface, Colin Kelly, Jackson Lansing. Thank you for joining us. It was great talking to you both and uh, all the success for, with this book that you guys deserve. It is, it is gorgeous. And shout out to your whole creative team because it is just, yeah. yeah. This was a great read, so thank you. Hey, hey thank, thank you guys you. very much. And uh, uh -huh. thank you, Comic Book Nation. Thank you, uh, everyone who's appreciated what we do. Thank See you guys later. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys.